based on a teacher-student foundation. The indigenous peoples were the teachers, educators. They provided original instructions on how to live and survive in the so-called new world. They provided directions on navigating the waterways, lakes, rivers, etc., hunting, fishing, housing, and medical knowledge. The second relationship was based on a time known as the fur trade era. Canadian furs grew to popularity due to the beaver, otter, and bison belts in the high fashion industry and military fashion industry throughout Europe. Due to the near extinction of the beaver and Eurasian otter in Europe, the value of these furs increased significantly in the New World. The third relationship, at the time during the Beaver Wars, when the French and the British were at war, 80% of the French and British military were made up of indigenous peoples. Due to the Napoleonic Wars and many other wars happening at the time in Europe, the British, the British and the French were not in a position to send any military reinforcements to what is known today as Canada. Therefore, they made many arrangements and agreements for the indigenous people's large participation in many battles and wars. If you want the specific battles and wars that occurred. Now, the indigenous peoples taught the Europeans everything that they know. They taught them how to hunt, how to survive in the lands. Without the indigenous peoples, they wouldn't know how to hunt, how to survive, how to, the, the, just in general, the land, the land base. Now, but once the Europeans took everything that they know from the indigenous peoples, once the Europeans learned everything that they could from the indigenous, they threw them aside and they became the Indian problem. And once they became the Indian problem, the indigenous termination policies began. One of the first indigenous termination policies, 1857, the Gradual Civilization Act. First piece of legislation that removed an indigenous person from his or her legal entitlement as an Indian. This policy also forcefully removed indigenous first and last names and replaced them with British, Dutch, and French names, <laughs> such as John, Hill, Dybel, and Edwards. My name is Strider Dybel Tailfeathers. Dybel, think about that. Indigenous peoples were forced to accept a number including the new name and carry a piece of identification proving their status with their nation, called a status card. Indigenous peoples are still forced to carry and renew every five years. Do you remember anywhere else in history where a specific group of peoples were forced to carry an identification tag on their persons? During World War II, Jewish people were forced to carry the Star of David. According to the federal government, as an indigenous status person, I must have a number and a card. I've had one since I was two years old. That's my Indian status card when I was two years old. My Indian status card is now five, and my Indian status card now. In Europe, people were also forced to wear an identification disc called an Eskimo identification, slowly phased out in the 1970s. 1860, the, in the Indians Land Act. This policy forced indigenous peoples off their traditional territory onto extremely unfavorable land and terrain. Indigenous communities in northern Ontario were forced to permanently, permanently settle in flood basins and in swamps. Many reserves in central Ontario were placed in barren territory, rocky terrain, places where nothing grows, places of complete isolation. 1867, the Confederation of Canada, the British North American Act. The Canadian Confederation was the process by which Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, Canada East, Canada West united into one dominion of Canada. Sir John A. Macdonald signed the letter that created Canada, Canada. Today, Canadians are on a journey to reconciliation because in the 1860s, the fathers of confederations, such as Sir John A. Macdonald, had no regard for the rights or interests of indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, what most of us call Canada. Now, what I mean by today, Canadians are on a journey to reconciliation is Canadians are on a journey to restore healthy relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. Now, at the time, and even today, many people believe that indigenous peoples at the time were uh, savages, that we were unsophisticated, that we had no debates or politics, but really, at the time, indigenous peoples comprised the many sovereign nations, all of which had very different political and economic social structures. They were self-governing with sophisticated land and resource management regimes. We had our own debates, our own politics, our own leaders, our own trade routes that went as far as Mexico. We were not unsophisticated, we were sophisticated. Now, if we move over here. The gra oh, before I say that, the Indians Land Act, this is a map with all the yellow dots are the re reservations in Canada and the blue dots are the settlements at the time. 1869. The reason that, uh, that I, of course, know a little bit about all of this yes. is because the, uh, the most profound relationship is between the uh, Aboriginal peoples and the Crown. Mm, and I, so the Crown, the yes. the Governor has to uh, not only understand that, but also witness a lot of activities. So, yes. for example, we, in our uh, the Lieutenant Governor's suite, we actually brought in a, 
wonderful exhibit on uh, the whole uh, question of residential schools to teach others uh, in government and so yeah. forth about residential schools. Yes. And we, uh, we actually do a lot of activities that help to try and facilitate the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And for uh, recommendations. So, yeah. yeah, indeed. One of, the, one of the things that I find interesting, because I grew up in Saskatchewan, is that the history that I learned about the relationship with Indigenous peoples in yes. Saskatchewan is quite different than it is in Ontario. Yes. And uh, so I'm always finding uh, new opportunities and new experiences here with, uh, for example, the, the Wampum Belt and uh, things like that. Yeah. So it's very important that you're doing this. Yes. Thank you very much. 1867, the Gradual Enfranchisement of Indian Act. Eventually, the Gradual Civilization Act became the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. If an Indigenous person spoke English, French, joined the Canadian Army, attended post-secondary or, or vocational school, if an Indigenous woman married a non-Indigenous man, the Indigenous person was forced to leave their community, their family, their land base, it would be illegal for them to be buried back in their community when they passed on. They lost all rights and entitlements as an Indigenous person under the Indian Act. The Gradual Enfranchisement Act also granted the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs extreme control over the status Indians. For example, the Superintendent had the power to determine who was of good moral character and therefore deserved certain benefits such as deciding if the widow, if the indigenous widow of an enfranchised Indian lives respectively and could therefore keep her children in the event of the father's death. The act also severely restricted the governing powers of band councils, regulated alcohol consumption, and determined who would be eligible for ban and treaty benefits. 1880, residential schools. Residential schools were established and run by the federal government as well as numerous religious denominations such as Anglican, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, etc. churches. Over 150,000 indigenous children aged 3 to 16 were forcefully taken from their families and communities to attend state and church-run residential schools where unspeakable atrocities occurred and minimal learning took place. The last residential school to close was in 1996 in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. Indian residential schools. A quote by Duncan Campbell Scott. Duncan Campbell Scott was head of the Department of Indian Affairs from 1913 to 1932 and in 1920 under his direction it became mandatory for all indigenous children between the ages of 7 to 15 to attend one of Canada's residential schools. A quote by Duncan Campbell Scott, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. That is the whole objective of this bill. 1881, amendment to grant officers of the Indian Department, including Indian agents, the same legal power as magistrates. Indigenous peoples who could not or would not be enfranchised became wards of the Crown under the Indian Act. Indian agents had complete magisterial power. They were the judge, jury, and executioners. The only criteria to become an Indian agent was to be white and male. The termination policy continued. 1885, past system imposed. Sir John Alexander MacDonald created the pass system. It was illegal for indigenous peoples to leave the reserve without permission from an Indian agent in which he would provide a pass. The indigenous person had to carry the pass with him at all times. If the indigenous person wanted to leave the reserve to visit a relative, a friend, go grocery shopping, go hunting, go fishing, visit a child in residential school if they were lucky enough to have their child attend a neighboring one in a neighboring town or city. 1885, Amendment to Prohibiting Aboriginal Religious Ceremonies and Dances. This amendment of the Indian Act prohibited Indigenous peoples from having practices, ceremonies, having social gatherings, spiritual practices. Those caught practicing were fined, jailed, and sacred items were confiscated. Now, by this time, in the 1885, it was illegal for Indi Indigenous peoples to gather in groups of three, speak their own language, practice religious ceremonies, and have social gatherings. Sir John Alexander MacDonald. Wilfrid Laurier said that the life of Sir John A. MacDonald is the history of Canada. And it's true. MacDonald shows us that Canada is built on colonism and oppression driven by a capitalist expansion and armed with state violence. Obviously, he was not singularly responsible for these policies, many of which began and continued after him. But as Prime Minister for nearly two decades, 1867 to 73 and 1878 to, 70 to 91, he presided over these policies. 
a quote by Sir John Alexander MacDonald. I quote, the great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and to assimilate the Indian people in all respects with the other inhabitants of the Dominion as speedily as they are fit to change. John A. MacDonald, 1887. Known as the founding father of confederation to many Canadians, however, to many indigenous peoples, he is known as the father of indigenous termination. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Otherwise known as the 94 Calls to Action or 94 Recommendations. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was de developed soon after Prime Minister Harper made a large apology to all the residential school survivors in 2008. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission led by Honorable Judge Murray St. Clair. Judge Murray St. Clair was an Ojibwe judge in Manitoba. At the time, he is currently a senator. In 2016, the Honorable Judge Murray St. Clair presented the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 Calls to Action, also known as the 94 Recommendations. These 94 recommendations have numerous categories such as health, civil servants, justice, and education, which are all, uh, which are all outlined in this package. The 94 calls, to, uh, 94 calls to Action, otherwise known as the 94 Recommendations, are supposed to begin the journey to restore healthy relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. For hundreds of years of racist le legislation policies, this country needs to follow through with these recommendations to, re to finally restore healthy relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. That's it.